Um, so, okay, so my lab studies intra individual, intra population variation in behavior, which I'll refer to as individual differences in behavior. And we're particularly excited about this level of biological diversity because it's that within population variation that provides the opportunity for selection. So, individual differences have been an explicit research focus within behavioral ecology for about 15 years now. Um, and during that time, I think one of the biggest and most exciting findings to come out of this work is the finding that individual differences in one behavior are not necessarily independent from individual differences in other behaviors. And instead, what we find is this pattern of correlations across behaviors, even behaviors that seem to us to be relatively you know, distinct behaviors. Um, and so the reason that we care about correlations between behaviors or between any traits is that quantitative genetics theory tells us that when traits are correlated and when that correlation has a genetic basis, uh, those traits might not be able to evolve independently. And so if we want to understand the evolution of any particular trait, we kind of have to know what we're dealing with in terms of how that trait is related to other traits. So in uh, individual differences research in non-human animal behavior, or non-human behavior, I guess, um, the, that research has focused almost exclusively on individual differences in average behaviors when animals are measured across multiple behavioral assays within a standard environment. But more recently, we've also started asking questions about how animals might differ in their plasticity in their behavior across environments. So individuals might differ in the ways or the degree to which they change their behavior in response to environmental variation. So today, Today, the question I'm going to focus on are, can we see correlations among different types of behavioral plasticity the same way we see correlations among trait means? So another way of asking this question is, are some genotypes more behaviorally plastic than other genotypes in multiple ways? So when we think about uh, different types of behavioral pl plasticity, of course, in Behavior, we love to have lots of terms for things, so we have lots of terms for different types of behavioral plasticity. And today I'll be talking about two distinct but non-mutually exclusive types of behavioral plasticity, contextual and developmental plasticity. So contextual plasticity uh, refers to the effect of a uh, stimulus or cue on behavior during the time that the stimulus is present. And so we can quantify this by comparing the behavior of either uh, the same individual or individuals who are assumed to be otherwise identical across two or more contexts. Developmental plasticity, oh wow, these slides really didn't come out great, so just do your best. Sorry, I'm happy to answer questions if this doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, so developmental plasticity refers to the effect of prior experience with a cue or stimulus on later behavior after the cue or stimulus is absent. And so I want to emphasize that by developmental, we only mean the effect of prior experience on later behavior. We're not assuming that the effect is irreversible. We're not assuming any kind of cellular changes are happening, although maybe they are. All we mean is uh, the effect of prior experience. And so we can quantify this by comparing the behavior of animals before and after we give them a presumably salient experience. Okay, so to ask whether um, these two types of behavioral plasticity could be genetically correlated. We turn to our favorite and only study organism, Drosophila melanogaster, uh, which provides some advantages for asking this question. So one is that uh, examples of these two types of behavioral plasticity had already been described for laboratory genotypes. Uh, but more importantly, we also have the availability of natural genotypes that we can measure repeatedly to estimate quantitative genetic parameters. So these natural genotypes are in red lines, originally derived from a single population in Raleigh, North Carolina. So they represent a sample of alleles that would be segregated in a natural population. Um, so if genotypes differ from each other at thousands of genomic locations, just like any two flies you could grab out of your kitchen. Um, so again, we're looking at quantitative genetic parameters rather than the effects of any uh, individual genes. And we also study these genotypes in heterozygous conditions so the effects of inbreeding are expected to be minimal. So to ask whether our examples of contextual and developmental plasticity are genetically correlated, we simply measure these two types of plasticity uh, in replicate across a panel of these natural genotypes. Okay, so 
on plasticity in patient site selection behavior. So we knew from laboratory genotypes that when late stage uh, larvae are getting ready to choose where they should pupate, that the presence of fruit cues is what prompts them to crawl away from the substrate and go pupate somewhere else. So this is probably what happens in, in natural populations. Uh, but if seemingly identical larvae are provided with a very similar substrate that lacks fruit cues, they never get the message that it's time to crawl away and pupate somewhere else, and so they pupate, they're more likely to pupate on the substrate. And so to test whether our laboratory or our natural genotypes also differ in this contextual plasticity, we simply measured replicate individuals of the same genotypes across these two contexts and asked how many of them pupated on versus off the substrate. And so this is an example where having the genotypes uh, really provides an advantage because you can't measure the plasticity of pupation behavior on one individual simply because individuals pupate only once in their lifetimes. So by measuring individuals who are the same genotypes in these two different contexts, we can estimate the genotype level contextual plasticity in this behavior. So that's what you see here. So here this y-axis is the proportion of individuals who crawl away from the food to pupate. Uh, in these two contexts. Each of, each of these lines represents uh, the average of a single genotype measured at least six times, or at least three times in each context, I should say, where one replicate was 25 larvae. And you can see that some genotypes make dramatically different decisions about where to pupate in the two different contexts, uh, representing highly plastic genotypes, whereas other genotypes pretty much do the same thing no matter what context they're in, uh, representing relatively low plasticity genotypes. Okay, so for developmental plasticity, we focused on aversive odor conditioning or odor learning, which is a very well-studied behavior in Drosophila dating back to Seymour Benzer. So like Seymour Benzer used this to show that like a gene could affect learning. You know, like that's, how, that's how far back this goes. Um, so as with all classical conditioning studies, uh, the idea of this uh, behavioral assay is to simply measure an animal's response to an odorant before or after an aversive training experience. So the odorant that we chose was ethyl acetate, which is a byproduct of fermenting fruit. So this is an ecologically relevant stimulus for fruit flies. Uh, and to measure their response to this odorant, we simply counted how many larvae crawled towards the odorant relative to a control odor. So then we pair the odorant with a mild but painful electric shock. And learning would be indicated if flies significantly reduce their preference for the odorant in response to this painful training experience. So to test this, we simply remeasure their ethyl acetate preference following training. Um, and so what we found is, again, substantial genetic variation in this measure of learning. Um, so here on this y-axis is ethyl acetate, oops, ethyl acetate preference. Um, and you can see it's before and after training. And again, each line represents the mean for one genotype measured at least six times, where in this case, each replicate uh, has 50 larvae. Um, and you can see, so at the population level, there's this overall downward trend, as you would expect for a measure of aversive conditioning. They don't like the stimulus as much after we pair it with electric shock. But you can also see that genotypes differ in the extent to which they change their behavior following training. So here's another uh, graph of the same data, uh, where here each of these bars represents one genotype, and uh, the y-axis is their learning score, which is just the difference in their ethyl acetate preference before and after training. Um, and I don't know if this graph, I don't, oops, I don't think this graph actually adds anything conceptually, but I just love, I mean, this is like a quantitative genetics section, right? So you can see, like, this is so quantitative. It just makes me happy to see that. Okay. So, okay, so, so far, all I've told you is that two phenotypes differ among genotypes, right? So that's, like, not very surprising. What we're really interested in is asking whether there's a genetic correlation between these two types of behavioral plasticity. And of course, you already know, since I set up the whole talk this way, that we did find a positive genetic correlation between these two types of plasticity, where genotypes over here show a greater change in behavior in response to the training experience in our learning assay, and also a greater change uh, in their pupation decision making across the fruit cues and no fruit cues context. Whereas genotypes down here, they don't care if you electroshock them in the presence of whatever, they're still doing the thing they were doing before. Um, so we have genotypes over, so these would be considered the uh, plastic genotypes and these would be the non-plastic genotypes. And so I think, uh, so we think there's a lot of terms for these things, we're not sure, but we think this might be 
first evidence for a genetic correlation between developmental and contextual behavioral plasticity. Um, and if this turns out to be a generalizable pattern across behaviors and species, which is my not very subtle cue to ask everyone to start studying whether these things are correlated in, in different behaviors in your species. Uh, so if this turns out to be a generalizable finding, I think it would be really important for the many evolutionary hypotheses that rely on genetic variation in behavioral plasticities. So things like uh, population persistence, uh, speciation, response to climate change, those generally focus on genetic or individual differences in plasticity within one behavior. And so now if we think that uh, some genotypes are more plastic than other genotypes in multiple behavioral dimensions, then we have to ask how things like selection uh, or processes resulting from selection on one, uh, one axis of uh, behavioral variation uh, might differ if we expect there to be a correlated response in other types of phenotypic plasticity. Um, so if you're, if you're working on any of those things and you want to talk to me about this, I would be excited to do that. Okay, so I want to especially thank uh, Sergey Nushkin, the NIH, and Shauna Limer, and apologize again for the slides kind of derby this. And if you're interested in these questions about individual differences in behavior and responses to the environment, you should go to Eric's poster Monday night um, in the behavior section. It's included in your registration fee, so this is like a no-risk opportunity. Um, and I hope to see you there, and I'm happy to take questions since I think we have time. <laughs> So they, they sometimes 